next we have an industry presentation on harmonizing human and machine intelligence in voice AI development. It is a pre-recorded session as uh, our presenter, Dr. Teresa O'Neill, Director of Solutions Architecture at NLU at iMerit, uh, is, is at a different time zone. So ladies and gentlemen, this is Teresa O'Neill. Can we please start the session? Hi, everyone. Welcome to this session on harmonizing human and machine intelligence in voice AI. Happy to be here uh, remotely today sharing some observations from our team at iMerit. So quick overview of the talk today. We're going to mention some of the interesting use cases that have come up over the recent couple of years in voice AI as a lot of new applications have entered the scene and then discuss sort of the strengths and weaknesses of the machine and human components of intelligence in ASR and NLU, and then observe how human intelligence can enrich these machine workflows and vice versa throughout the ASR and NLU development pipeline, drawing on some examples of our work at iMerit, and show how leveraging human intelligence from end to end in ASR and NLU development pays great dividends in this industry. So over the past few years, we've seen many changes to the way that we work, the way that we shop, the way that we communicate. And with these changes has come some explosions on the technical side in applications of voice AI based technology to conversational intelligence, for example, extracting business intelligence and analytics from conference calls and sales conversations. We've seen a proliferation and improvement in the quality of intelligent voice assistance across a number of industries. We also see growing use cases in searchable voice and voice-based search. So I can now query Google using voice, but I can also uh, search through a recorded stream of text, for example, a podcast for topics of interest and keywords of interest. Um, we're also seeing greater attention paid to making this technology accessible through closed captioning and broader multilingual coverage in expanding markets um, in, for example, India. Um, and these use cases are occurring kind of across a number of different industries, including the automotive space, finance, commerce, and customer service. So at this great moment of, of growth in this space, we're trying to find ways of improving the technology, leveraging the unique perspectives that the nuanced human understanding has, while also taking advantage of improved performance of machine learning algorithms and the efficiencies gained by large open source models. So some recent breakthroughs that are informing this development and really just looking at the last couple of years come with the emergence of transformers as the new kind of state of the art in ASR development. And then <clears throat> expanding this technology to a number of different markets and languages, we have Google recently releasing large scale end-to-end -end models, first kind of focusing on the linguistic diversity of a landscape like India, showing that training models on a multilingual corpus yields somewhat good performance on languages that have historically been lower resource in this domain. Then recently we have major breakthroughs coming with releases of large models like GPT-3, which have groundbreaking uh, natural language understanding and generative capabilities. Now these capabilities are still very generic. What remains uh, as a challenge that we'll talk about in, um, throughout the course of this uh, presentation is how to align these capabilities with the more nuanced human social understanding of what is desirable, what is aligned with an audience's expectations, and what is appropriate for different human social contexts. And we're seeing some interesting developments on that front with models like Instruct GPT, which use human in the loop feedback workflows to better align these large models with human sensibilities. <clears throat> So where do we see the machine intelligence making great strides in recent years? Well, of course, they're very fast and we have near real-time speech-to-text capabilities. We also have large scale public pre-trained models which allow us to quickly spin up custom use cases. There's greater breadth in the coverage of these models across multiple languages and also across custom domains and industries um, that allow coverage of kind of specialized contexts, for example, in medicine and finance. And then these machines, uh, these models are very powerful. They allow us to pursue uh, more multimodal pipelines from the ASR phase of understanding a body of voice text 
um, all the way to natural language understanding. And we see further improvements in nuance and the power to customize these for different specific social contexts with human feedback. On the human side, we know that the humans tend to still be more accurate uh, than the machines. And so we have better performance on input of variable quality. We have better performance on uh, challenges related to contextual disambiguation. Humans are uniquely positioned to bring industry expertise and subtlety and nuance and multilingual understanding to help specialize these models across different industries. <clears throat> and of course, humans are always going to outperform machines on detecting social nuance, relevance, and alignment with specific norms. So let's look at a couple of examples across each of these different parameters. On the accuracy front, the machine intelligence brings us rapid speed, but although we see these reports, very uh, exciting reports of below 5% word error rates across some of these high-performing models, these still typically represent idealized data sets where speech is very clear, where there's single language speech, where there's not a lot of variation in the sociolinguistic profiles of the speakers or the acoustic environments that they're in. A number of studies have shown that in re realistic contexts, <clears throat> we find word error rates closer to 30%, which is still not quite there because real data is noisy. Humans are noisy, humans are rich in variation. So human intelligence is uniquely positioned to bring us this accuracy bump as we continue to refine these models. We know that human acoustic uh, auditory and psycholinguistic processing can be very sensitive to this kind of sociolinguistic variation. And this allows us to build workflows where human intelligence is refining ASR output to facilitate reinforcement learning feedback loops. Humans are very good at context-based homophony resolution. Models are getting better, but they're not there yet. And humans can also help us develop useful taxonomies of non-speech noise that are specific to a given acoustic environment. So we can start to reduce uh, insertion errors. <clears throat> in the domain of specialization and customization, machine intelligence is bringing us uh, improved capabilities in deploying models for very specific domains like medical care, for example, uh, health, voice assistance, and <clears throat> automated um, uh, telemedicine services. But there are still some challenges, for example, in, um, across registers of speech and we do see some performance dips across domains that are still kind of developing these custom lexicons and custom language models. And this is where human experts can come in, identify gaps in that performance, review ASR output and solve for some drift as lexicons change and as needs change. At iMerit, for example, we have professional data enrichment teams that are fluent in these specialized lexicons. And so they can provide that necessary feedback to help <clears throat> reinforce the performance of ASR models deployed specifically in medicine, compliance, and finance contexts. We also face a very interesting explosion of use cases into multilingual markets with greater accessibility than ever before. And multilingual end-to-end -end models are giving great performance boosts for languages that were very low resource in this, in this domain. But we still face challenges where um, the size of the corpora that are used to build these models are quite asymmetrical and really not in line with the size of the speech communities. Consider, for example, the relative corpus size of Bengali versus Hindi. Well, both of them are top 15 languages, but we can see that Bengali is, is dramatically underrepresented in the total corpus. So we still see some limitations of performance of ASR in these fast developing markets, although there have been a lot of improvements. So here's where our human workforces can come in and provide richer uh, annotated training data sets and richer ground truth transcription sets to start addressing these gaps and continue to improve access to ASR for languages that, although they have vast numbers of speakers, remain somewhat underserved. Related challenge, um, despite these, these boosts, is that in many of these speech communities, for example, take the Indian landscape, Speech is not monolingual. Everyone tends to engage in the full repertoire of their language competence in conversation. So in real conversation across a number of domains, we're likely to see extensive code switching and multilingual speech. And models tend to be built on the assumption of artificially monolingual speech behavior. This is simply not the reality. So our human workforces can come in and again, provide this validation, uh, ground truth training data <clears throat> and custom model enrichment that better aligns these corpora with reality, 
whether that is through better multilingual language models that are sensitive to the sociolinguistic and syntactic nuance of code switching, or whether they're through transcription ground truth sets. <clears throat> Finally, although machine intelligence, as we get into the NLU phase of the pipeline, taking that transcribed data and extracting interpretations and insights from it, we've seen vast improvements on performance in PII detection, use cases like NER, sentiment analysis, topic identification, deeper semantic interpretation, for example, for multi-turn task-based dialogue systems, and <clears throat> for relevance detection, so linking entities and topics and understanding which entities are relevant to which topics in a given text, this is still challenging and still an area where machine models tend to underperform. Nevertheless, human labeling is very time consuming at scale. So we want to harmonize these two sets of strengths between the machine and human workflows to extract the best processes that will facilitate both. So humans can support the curation of edge case repositories, which will inform data collection initiatives and address active learning goals. So you can better target gaps in the performance of a model and gaps in the original corpus. And they can also validate and refine the machine labeled corpora, which can be done in a very efficient weak labeling pass to provide some explanatory insights where the machine falls short. And this allows us to better target those shortcomings versus a purely black box approach. For example, if we find that a model is underperforming on interpretation of modification relations and entity relations uh, for a particular syntactic paradigms, a human might be able to detect that pattern, describe it in a meaningful way, and address gaps in the corpus where one of those patterns needs additional representation. This could drive, for example, a synthetic data creation initiative with these human insights. And then as we venture into the territory of nuance and context sensitivity at the social scale, we know that machines can perform very well on basic categorization and basic content moderation use cases. But there is always going to be an element of context sensitivity that the machine might struggle with without additional feedback from a human labeled workforce. So here's where we bring in the human intelligence. Our shared norms of what, what is appropriate, what is safe, what is relevant, what is true, it's a somewhat iterative process that involves negotiation within a given community. And so we can define those parameters as a community of labelers and data scientists, and then provide feedback to the machine through supervised learning and through reinforcement learning that will improve that level of nuance. So the automatic classification becomes tuned to a specific context. For example, if we're evaluating content safety or appropriateness, it really depends on what sort of discourse context we're in. So if somebody says, I can't believe how badly he screwed that up, I wish he would just die already in a work meeting, this is clearly inappropriate according to most workplace norms. But the same utterance in the context of gamer chat where somebody is talking about dying in the context of the game is not at all threatening. In fact, it's playful speech that is quite appropriate. And we can see that here where the follow-up utterance is, I'm about to make that happen, go left. And we can tell that they're now talking about their gamer personas. So it's very important to keep these contexts in mind uh, and prepare dedicated uh, human-informed data sets to train for these different contexts. <clears throat> Finally, our productive, our, our generative models are getting much, much better at abstraction and nuance with breakthroughs, especially with the release of GPT-3 in the performance on abstractive summarization tasks, question answering, and so on. And there's a lot of growing adoption of these conversational intelligence tools that will provide abstractive summaries of a given text. Um, this is extremely valuable um, as we, we have limited time to sift through long transcripts and we need help kind of cutting to the chase. However, the training corpora that we're used to build these models, we know contain misinformation, bias, all kinds of toxic content. And this raises the risk that the model will be sort of infected with this bias. So human feedback is critical for driving improved social alignment. Um, and we can do this through supervised learning and through reinforcement learning workflows where the human is providing constant feedback uh, to the machine and helping to shape the reward um, uh, functions that are driving the machine's predictions to align it more and more closely with the set of human expectations. This has shown really promising results, particularly in some recent studies from OpenAI, 
showing that the natural language generation model becomes more honest, relevant, and helpful. So beginning with a particular question or goal, we have a human workforce create uh, models, create sample data uh, that can be used essentially for supervised learning, and we make our way around this, this circle. The machine then takes a stab at generating texts based on that training corpus, and then the human will evaluate those results and provide feedback to the machine, ranking the results and providing some scores um, and evaluations of their quality. This will inform the reward function, for example, in a, a bandit model that will help to tune the model's choices as it goes forward and generates yet another prompt. And so we have a very rich feedback loop and cycle of reinforcement learning informed by that human intelligence. And this pipeline remains active across both the ASR and NLU components of development. So you can see in the purple and red arrows here, the sort of communication feedback loops between machine and human throughout the workflow. <clears throat> Suppose we begin with data collection. The data scientist may curate a body of data that is going to be used for supervised learning and training. A human workforce who understands the use case deeply will perform labeling or ground truth preparation, as well as validation and analysis. And this is what's going to generate insights around the validity of the basic assumptions of the model and observations around the edge cases that might be present in that data set. This in turn informs parameter selection, and it also informs the data requirements and data collection initiatives so that we know as we go forward for more efficient uh, data collection and labeling, we can target specific cases and specific classes for active learning, or we can synthesize data where there are gaps. Then as the data is passed to the model for training, at the testing stage, the model is going to generate its, its predictions. It can perform auto labeling to facilitate faster growth of the training data set. And it will also generate performance metrics which help us identify weaknesses or flaws in our assumptions around what the categories should be. And in turn, once the model is deployed, it can accelerate the data collection process by gathering live data that become part of this feedback loop. So at each stage, there is a kind of a synthesis of the human and machine insights and a passing of the baton back and forth of learnings and insights that will further hone the parameter set, the data set, and the predictions. So to sum up, we can see that in recent years with the growth of this technology, the machine and human components bring a lot to the table, but each one has sort of weaknesses that are still undergoing development or simply limitations because of who and what they are that the other one can support. So together, just taking the metaphor to its logical extreme, we can put these two types of intelligence, machine and human, in both harmony and counterpoint. They work together and they also serve different functions that support each other throughout the development life cycle to yield better and better performance on voice AI applications from ASR to NLU. Thanks very much for attending this talk from iMerit. Please feel free to contact me by email uh, with any questions. And we also invite you to stop by our booth at the Voice Tech Summit. iMerit's booth is